I'm conscious that it's turned three o'clock and attendees are still coming through, but what we will do is kick off and start to begin our webinar about the state of employee engagement 2024-25. And um, what we'll be doing on this webinar is giving you very much the headlines and highlights of the report and what has been identified as the HR professionals top priorities and biggest challenges they see coming for the years ahead. Um, this webinar is hosted by myself. My name is Melisan Foster or Mel for short, and I'm responsible for our client experience here at WorkBuzz. And I'm joined by the wonderful Ryan. Right. Hi, everyone. Uh, yes, people science director here at WorkBuzz, which is just a fancy way of saying I'm an occupational psychologist, which in itself is just a fancy way of saying I'm interested in all things human behavior and motivation in the workplace. So 15 years or so now getting involved in employee engagement, culture research with organizations globally. So as you can probably all imagine, this type of stuff gets me really excited to see what the data is telling us and what it actually means for ourselves as practitioners and professionals in this space. So looking forward to seeing you questions and, and comments come through as well. Yeah, absolutely. And Ryan's hit it exactly on the head there. We are really keen to make this interactive. Please do ask us questions as we go through the presentation. We'll do our best to round to them at the right point in time in the webinar. And um, I appreciate and thank you, Lois, for pointing out that the chat is disabled. If, if our marketing team are on and they can enable it, that would be great. But if not, then please just ask us questions and we'll bring them to the forefront of this webinar. So without further ado, let's kick off and, and talk to you about some of our findings. Um, so first of all, what's really important to bring in here is that what we're seeing is the data points that of the survey that we run called State of Employee Engagement that we've ran for five years so far. So 2019, I think was our first one. And what's great is to be able to build on that year on year so that we've got that longitudinal analysis and it enables us to see trends within the market and where people are focusing their attention now um, and based on what they've done before and that's pivoted. Um, so I really like it. I call this at work buzz a bit of a pop sort of the charts um, to see what's going up, what's going down and, and what's changing. And it's it's really interesting data that we use internally here at work buzz. It also helps our clients understand how they're benchmarking against others and what's happening in the wider market. Um, the research itself this year had responses from over 648 HR professionals, predominantly from the UK and US, but there are other countries involved there. And about 48% of those respondents, so just under half, were at director or manager levels. Um, there are wide industry perspectives included, so it's not um, specific to any particular industry it's very much agnostic um, it's really useful to read but also be mindful that if you have a specific industry that you're working in a specific space and you want to have a follow-up conversation at work buzz we're all about sharing knowledge and, and speaking to you all so if there's certain questions that you have about your industry and you're on the webinar now we'd love the q a box to come to life but also if you haven't and you want to follow up with us, then we're always open for an email. And I think hello at workbuzz.com is an easy access to us to understand, you know, how you're trending and ask us a question and get involved with the discussion. Um, so that's very much how the research was ran. And what we've done, we've published the research and, and the state of employee engagement came out couple of weeks ago so you may well be much further ahead than I am in terms of reading all these data points but what's been really positive to see is that during the past year the majority of people that responded to this said that employee engagement had got better or much better so there you can see you can combine that 20 percent with the 38 percent and you get almost six percent so almost two-thirds of people saying that it's got better. Um, there's some that are very much saying the same and only 15% saying that it's getting worse. Um, for me, obviously, this is, is great stats to have, but Rai, I'm really conscious that you as a people scientist are out in the field, you're consulting with a, a lot of our clients. Is this mirroring what you see as an individual? Generally, yes. Generally, uh, I think we saw um, engagement uh, go up a little bit um, and peak when COVID first hit, which it feels like a long time ago now, but we did see that kind of sense of togetherness and we need to get through this, that kind of sentiment going through organizations. And then it started to dip um, a little bit uh, over the following years. And we have seen over the past year, generally with lots of customers, that 
um, engagement start to improve. But of course, with something like this, it's very much industry specific. And there are lots of external factors as well that can have an impact on engagement levels. You know, we often talk about engagement driving performance, but sometimes performance can impact engagement. Yes. So for those businesses out there that are really thriving at the moment, naturally see some of that have an impact on the colleagues where organizations are perhaps um, working in very difficult environment under difficult circumstances at the moment. And there's a lot of pressure that can impact engagement through things like uncertainty or not being clear on what the next few years might look like, for example, confidence in the future of an organization. So it often depends on what's happening, but generally we're seeing improvements and that's largely coming from organizations actually having more of a continuous and really proactive focus on their culture. Yeah, that's fantastic to hear. And hopefully it resonates with other people that are watching this webinar. Um, but if not, then obviously there's, there's always good practice to be shared with Absolutely. those organizations. And, and even if they're marginal gains, they're still gains. Um, and sometimes it's very hard, easy to be up ourselves on, on anything going lower or, or being neutral um, when actually sometimes it's a picture of life. And as Roy says, there's so many other factors that can impact your engagement. Um, and just even looking at performance could be a good tell for many organisations. Um, another question that we like to ask is around how difficult it is to reach your deskless or frontline workers as many of you know the way that work is we, we are absolutely sector agnostic our platform can work with for anyone anywhere um but we're really conscious that the thing that we do very well is engage with these workers that aren't in front of a laptop like most of us are day to day um, and what we're hearing from the people that we surveyed is that the majority say that this is OK. It's actually easy for them or very easy for them to reach their deskless or frontline workers. Um, but I come from an internal comms background. And one of the things that I believe, though, is, is that reaching them is one thing. Engaging them is a whole other matter. Um, so with having Ryan in the room as a consultant, the question I wanted to pose to you about this was if you had a tip to share with the audience about keeping those workers engaged and up to date what would your top tip be uh in for con in for consistency it's going to sound really basic but some sort of things if you've got a largely deskless workforce frontline workers um make it as simple as you can for managers whether that's shift managers general managers store managers whatever it might be really simple templates almost like team talk team briefing templates of like these are the three key messages you need to make sure that get relayed across to the members within your team and if you've got people for example who are working on different shifts who is a, a, a supervisor for example that's going to be responsible for taking those same three yeah. messages and getting it out because what we see time and time again is this dilution of key messages happening when you look at your data by job role um and often Often frontline workers, deskless workers are the most likely to say that they're not hearing certain messages or they're hearing things word of mouth rather than it coming from a, a, a more formalized or mm -hmm. consistent brief mm -hmm. um, or from a one to one chat with their manager. Yeah. Layer into that the problem that you've got a lot of pressure on line managers at the moment. So we're seeing well-being at its lowest levels for frontline managers and middle managers and businesses at the moment. And if you're facing that as an organization, how can you expect your managers to kind of role model great comms and all of the other aspects of people management? So my tip would be you need to make it as simple as possible for them. And the second one, but kind of linked to it as an organization, how can you really get the insight you need around comms? You know, not just whether people understand things, but what are the channels that they're using? What are the channels they want to use? Uh, are you throwing too much comms at them? Is it relevant? And that needs to be put up more by role so that you can really understand how to get those messages to different people, different demographics in the workforce. I think there's a big opportunity there for businesses to improve how they do that. Yeah, absolutely agree. And I think there's also this this piece around the focus around line managers delivering the message when actually they might not be the strongest communicators and the trust. Ed, Edelman released the trust index every year and, and always when it comes to trust people that look like me people that are my peers are normally people that i'm most likely to trust so just thinking about is there a part that they can play in rolling out those briefings as well is something that i'd, I'd encourage people to, to be mindful yeah. of as well it's good to hear thank you Haley. there we go we've got our chat back up look at that uh, there's always somebody working in the background at work buzz and squirreling away so appreciate that thank you Haley, for sorting that for us 
So please do continue to use everybody. Right, so that's a bit about the deskless and frontline workers. Um, what has been a consistent question in the state of employee engagement and something that we've really loved exploring is about frequency. And what we've seen is that there has been a more of a shift over the last year of increased frequency. Um, but what we're finding is that it's not just employee engagement surveys, they might be other survey types. And, and this is something that you can do in workbooks, but things like um, that are more action orientated, that might have a more of a DNI lens or, or, or on demand poll. Um, but the key thing as well on, on this slide, that's an interesting stat, is that piece over the last year, what we've seen is that the stat from of no regular surveys or I don't know has dropped dramatically from 25% to 5%. And I feel that that may be demonstrating that people are moving on this more um, and just sharing that they're focused on it or they're listening more um, in terms of, of thinking about that. But just out of interest, we, we're really keen, I think, to find out about if people have, have changed frequency as of late, is it increased frequency? Has anybody pivoted to less frequencies? If anybody's got anything that they'd like to share in the chat, that would be really helpful, I'm sure, for everybody else that that's part of this webinar. Is there anything that you've seen in terms of client case studies that have increased or decreased based on your... Yeah, definitely. And I'd be really interested for anyone in the audience to know if they've got any nervousness about pivoting back mm -hmm. to less frequent surveys after moving to more frequent surveys. I think the... The idea that always being close to our colleagues and always listening to their feedback and keeping the finger on the pulse to use that, you know, phrase, it, there's a lot of, um, you know, there's a lot of value in that argument and you can certainly see the importance of it. I think for me, I've always thought that if, if you have an organization that's only surveying once a year, but is genuinely able to connect the dots post survey through the rest of the year of this is how we've really listened to you and used it to influence what we're doing as an organization to enhance employee experience, strength and culture, whatever. That for me is a far more valuable employee listening strategy than an organization that's surveying weekly or monthly, but not able to demonstrate that it's, it's actually leading to anything. Um, and we often hear this in organizations around how do you get the balance right so you get enough feedback from colleagues without it feeling like it's overwhelming for them. Yeah. And so my again, my advice around this is always to think about what's right for your organization based on your readiness for this type of insight and really thinking about what's realistic for you to drive some meaningful change off the back of it, yeah. rather than just following a general trend to do more frequent listening because of the organizations are completely agree it's like a conversations I often have with my little one about not following the crowd and thinking about what's right for you um and it very mm -hmm. much still applies in business doesn't it oh absolutely absolutely okay good right then I am conscious we've had a great question that's very much about reaching people without what email addresses so I'm going to answer this as it comes and thank you Lois for, for sharing this um in terms of how do you reach employees who don't have work email addresses, so they don't tend to use personal email addresses for these purposes, completely cognizant that there's a common problem that a lot of our clients share. Um, do you want to start and then I can add if anything? Yeah, I mean, there are a number of different ways. So, so some some organizations would be able to use um, some information like that uh, if if colleagues were used to using that to to get involved in 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 things like employee listening surveys. But I think sometimes, you know, the way in which we can really utilize things like QR codes, and the resurgence of the QR code yes. in the previous yeah, year. Yeah, yeah. COVID made it come back. COVID really, brought really back did, the QR so. code. And the QR codes are really, um, we really see a big boost, don't we, for some yes. organizations that have maybe traditionally struggled to even get over 50% because of the nature, of the nature of the workforce suddenly getting up in the 70s and having a lot more confidence that they've got data which is more representative of all job roles across the organization. So things like the QR code and again, how you communicate it and make that available in all the different sites, make it really accessible, make it really easy for people you know, meet them where they are in the workplace and, and make it really easy and make it feel for them that it's just as important for them to take part in this. So you've made it as easy for them 
um, as some others. So, for example, with a QR code, you can just use an employee identifier. That's yeah. really easy for them. Maybe it's a payroll number or a date of birth or something that they can just use once they've um, hit the QR, uh, they've scanned the QR code and they're straight in, they can do their survey. Yeah. Up and away they go. They can complete it in 10, 15 minutes and get back to what they were doing. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, quite survey focused. I would say what we also do is we, we partner with quite a lot of um, employee apps. So there are many employee apps out there. A lot of them actually focus on, on desk as workforces as well. That means that they already have comms channels in the palm of their hand so what workers does is sometimes piggyback things like that so that yeah. it's in front of them and, and again what Brian said meet them where they are um that said I am conscious that if you don't have per email addresses or personal email addresses sometimes it may mean that you're an even more traditional organization and as an ex-internal communicator I do still believe that a lot of the traditional comms channels still have a place in this world posters as Ryan said you can embed QR codes and things like that so it means that it goes into a digital mode from an analog type of, of comms channel um but they do actually absolutely still have a place and, and same with newsletters or, or things like that it's it's understanding what your employee base will engage with yeah. as always um and back to that point about the managers with the really consistent like yeah, team talk really, templates what yeah. are the absolute key messages you need to get across and that can absolutely relate to this type of work as well Particularly, particularly when that's a topic that a lot of managers within, um, you know, sectors, for example, like construction, manufacturing, engineering, can often have less confidence around talking about the employee surveying. Yes. Piece. Yeah. So really helping make it really simple for them is 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 hugely impactful. Great. Good. Thank you, Lois. Great question. Okay, well, moving forward, um, I told you this is my favorite part, the top of the charts, top of the pops moment, top of the charts. So topping the charts, no, number one is well-being. Um, we've seen employee well-being rise one place to hit the top of, of the priorities that HR are seeing ahead for 2020, 2024 to 25. Um, what's really interesting, though, with this whole graph, so we've got well-being at the top, you've got engagement and experience at second place, and the third place attracting talent. But the moves around this chart are really interesting to us. So retention in particular has plummeted quite significantly by eight points, whereas areas like employee engagement and experience, EDIB, so equity, diversity, inclusion and belonging, um, internal communications, learning and development, you're seeing them move by a couple of two to four places, all of those items. Um, but I think for me, it's really interesting to see retention so much further down. Um, right, is there anything that surprises you from looking at this graph that we're seeing here? Um, I mean, with the retention piece, I always look at this and think, well, if you if you focus on the employee engagement experience and the well-being of your colleagues and culture and particularly D&I, which is, is is rightly jumped up, then you would retain your best talent anyway. So I wasn't if 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 those things weren't at the top of the pot, to use your thing, and, <laughs> and, and retention had dropped, then that might be quite a surprise. But I actually think that's absolutely right. You mm. know. I remember back in my early days of work, working in hospitality, I would never ask customers, are you going to come back? You would just focus on delivering the best yeah. possible service and experience that you could, knowing that it would probably make them more likely to come back. I think the performance and productivity one, I hear lots of um, C-suite executives talk about performance culture. And so I wonder if we would put top priorities for C-suite alongside top priorities for HR, would it look different? Um, but I think there's some... You know, um, the chief people officer um, friend of mine said the other day that he really doesn't like the performance culture terminology um, okay. and everything that it kind of, uh, the connotations of it. Yeah. And actually he likes to think of it more as growth culture uh, because ultimately that's what you're aiming for as an organization. Um, that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, again, focusing on the right things and the right language, knowing that some of those other maybe more harsher sounding things we've talked about previously that therefore do have some of those negative connotations across the uh, across the workforce yeah. will happen as a natural byproduct I think is that I think there's some of that in there that really it's just the language and the way we're talking about the workplace at the moment has shifted yeah agreed and I think it's so important to review that and to be really mindful of the words that we're, we're using and how it will need to change I love that shift to more of a growth mindset uh, yeah something yeah. that yeah 
is, is an easy replacement around performance. Okay, good. Right then, let's move into the biggest challenges we're seeing around when it comes around recruiting new people. Um, the top scoring um, response was around the qualified candidates. So having a shortage of talent pipeline is by far the biggest factor and challenge when it comes to recruiting new people into the organisations that we surveyed. The second part was around culture fit, the second biggest reason given, and the third biggest reason was competition with similar organisations. Mm -hmm. And I'd love to know if this resonates with any of you, if there's any other things that you see come to life here. Um, really as well, this, this for me is, is really interesting because I think depending on the clients that I see, it could be that certain job roles are harder to fill. There's, there's been battle over engineers probably for the last three years in, in my field and things that I've seen consult on. Yeah. Um, but Rai, what's your thoughts around this and, and anything that you want to share? I don't know. Yeah, I know. I, I think, think you are, don't you? Yeah, I think, this, the, I think this is about, you know, we talk about growth mindset or just, you know, a big thing here is like really trying to rethink some of our, our recruitment practices, you know, shortage of qualified candidates or who are qualified candidates? What do we mean by qualified candidates for our roles? Like, could we be thinking about where potential talent could come from differently? Yeah. I mean, I remember working with a big um, hotel chain in the lead up to Brexit, and they were obviously very worried about um, what Using impact it. that would have yeah. on talent if they were losing housekeepers in their flagship hotels. So what they did was a really big drive on um, trying to uh, recruit um, working parents who could actually do a shorter shift in yeah. the hotels, but albeit between the school runs. And so they did a full focused recruitment strategy around it. And guess what? They brought far more working parents into the organization Brilliant. and actually retained them because they found it as a, as a really great place where they could meet. Um, and, and, you know, uh, all of that kind of social connectedness that yeah. they got from, from being in that particular workplace. I think the other bit that you touched on around you mentioned about engineering as, as an example is what is our real um a value proposition mm -hmm. for candidates because mm. every single company in the world will say we're going to look after you and we're going to grow you and you know all of that no one's going to say the opposite of that on their, yeah, on their website that's, that. that's the real story for someone to work i don't know in a technology role within a grocery company why would they want to work in a role there rather than go to a startup or try and get a job at Google, for example? Yeah. You know, you have to really think about what is the story? How do we really attract the type of candidate that we want and that we need for our organization? Um, and I, I think there's generally lots of improvement that can be made um, around that. And then the final point I would say about this is really think carefully about what we mean by cultural fit. Okay. So from an ed &I perspective, one of the things that we need to be really careful about doing is um, going into those kind of recruitment process with the thought of a profile of a candidate of personality type or anything that's going to be the right fit for an organization, because that is one of the reasons why we've ended up having large pockets of very homogenous groups inside um, organizations that can lead to those kind of echo chambers and yeah. lack of growth mindset. So um whether you're in the culture ad or the culture fit approach to recruitment i just think it's one to really uh reflect on that i think it's really important to challenge because that was the second most cited reason that people are finding it a challenge but challenging your own mindset around what culture fit looks like as you yeah you say, a bit of culture ad um and, and you can also use your own data and your surveying data as well to, to do this of course i'm going to say yeah. that but you can because if you understand where you've sourced your talent from you can then use your lever data and your employee engagement data to have a look at well do we see that people who come through recruitment websites or yeah. agencies for example have higher or lower levels of engagement than people who come um through directly the website and our lovely colleague john backhouse if he was here right now would be saying he has seen that actually levels of engagement for people who apply for directly through a website tends to be higher than people who come from those big, bigger recruitment websites, oh, which oh. I, I'll not name. Many examples, there are lots of competitors yeah. in that space. But no, that's really interesting insight. And it demonstrates, I think, that direct approach is, is ideal. I mean, it's something as well that we see in terms of referrals, 
for, for the client space and employee space tend to be a direct fit because it's people know you they're closer to you so the more that you can bring that to life the better yeah. and often think. organizations will have the data so it's just joining yeah the results with it all yeah being wise to it okay moving us forward then retention so we talk about recruitment but we love to talk about retention because it's one thing adding to the bucket it's a completely different thing if you've got a hole in your bucket um i'm sure you all know the good point that goes with that um what we're seeing in terms of trends around retention is that it is very much a split market so some people are telling us that it's getting worse um a lot of the majority saying it's staying pretty much the same um and then some saying it's getting easier but it's it's almost a, a more of a, a level playing field back that pie chart on the left hand side um but what's even more interesting to us is then asking the set the follow-up question about what okay so you, if it is a challenge then what is the biggest challenge that it, when it comes to retaining existing employees um and what's really interesting is of course the top one that we typically see um, is around salary and benefits, so offering a competitive salary and benefits. Secondary, and this I think has come on a rise since more generations and, and post COVID, but flexi work and flexi working arrangements. That said, it's important to, that it, to, for us to note that it's not just where, but it's also when, when we talk about flexi work and, and being really mindful of that. Um, the third reason that was most cited was around buying into the company culture and journey so where we're headed and the fourth was the um, meeting employee expectations but that's very much in terms of their career development and um, career development and pay are common reasons that I see but Rai you're much more um, out with clients at this point in time mm. what are you seeing what are your thoughts on this mm. I mean, pay always comes up as a lower scoring area on surveys and a main stated reason people might be thinking about leaving. Um, and I think it always will be, won't it? Because when you get asked those questions in surveys, you're never going to say, oh, 100, you know, I everyone's not going to well stay enough. there 100% happy. Yeah, yeah. You might, might as well give a little bit of challenge and feedback and see what it leads to. But, I, you know, we never see it as being a, the biggest driver of intention to leave unless it's wildly out of sync with Great what other colleagues in the same organization are being paid for a similar role or what they might be able to um, achieve in a similar doing the exact same job elsewhere but i think you know again what we are seeing is lots of organizations really trying to make their culture the differentiator and i know it sounds a bit cheesy but actually you know colleagues um and what we're seeing more from feedback is that that's what people really want people really want somewhere where they can be themselves, they can enjoy the work they do, enjoy the colleagues that they're around um, and really feel a part of something, feel that sense of belonging. I've noticed lots of organizations that I'm working with that that question around, do you feel you belong here is increasing in terms of how much it's a driver of engagement. Yeah. So, you know, how we can really create that and create something special as, as organizations for our employees, I think is, is gonna be a huge advantage. We are seeing lots of, um, um, organizations kind of sit up and, and almost panic a little bit that when we look at data by different demographics we're seeing that the kind of the 16 to 24 year old demographic tend to be more critical around things yeah. like career development yeah scoring lower around questions relating to it being more likely to state it's a reason that they're thinking about moving on but again often that's you know there'll, there'll be some context to that sometimes you know we, we've heard about generational differences that maybe they're more open to adventure and trying new different, yeah. uh, trying different things but a lot of it that we see actually comes down to actually having visibility yeah. and confidence in what the next steps and are mm -hmm. and what they would need to do to actually unlock that mm -hmm. yeah. either now or in the future so it's more about having that clarity and confidence that it's achievable here yeah. rather than feeling like they're not getting it at the point in which they deserve it necessarily or being impatient for it yeah um do you think there is a lot of and that's really important because i do think a lot of colleagues are focusing on what the next step might be mm -hmm. and we need to try and get them really excited and energized by the here and now and yeah. focus on like the job content rather than job progression and things like that. So I think there's, there's a real opportunity for us to do that. As yeah, I heard a, a metaphor on a podcast that I was listening to, so it's not mine, I can't claim it at all. But instead of thinking it as a career ladder, as we've traditionally thought about it, think about it as a career climbing wall, where when you climb and traverse a wall, you sometimes go to the side before you go up or you go horizontal and, and sometimes you have to go down to find the right pathway through. 
Um, but doing that job drafting with Gen Zs is something that they absolutely love. And, and if you can, what a, what a benefit to be able to unlock and what, you know, what an offer to be able to put in front of an individual. So super excited. Definitely. Okay, good. Right then. Moving through to productivity and performance. Um, what's interesting is 55% of people said that productivity and performance has stayed the same or got worse. When you break that figure down, actually, only 19% said it got worse and 36% said it had stayed the same. So there's a lot of just neutrality. We're, we're just in the same space. So, um, you know, a fifth of them roughly saying that it's actually worse. And then a lot of them saying it's actually got better when it comes to productivity and performance, which is good and, and maybe a sign of, of the macro market, I, I might say. Um, and then there's the piece on the right hand side about what's the biggest challenge when it comes to productivity and performance. Um, and the top reason that we're seeing there is around collaboration. So fostering that across teams. I think as we are on a webinar, um, we can see that in terms of fostering that collaboration can be really, really difficult. Um, and it's that piece around when you're remote, sorry, um, it's really, it can be even harder because people are trying to collaborate with you in, in a different way. The second reason that we're seeing is around skills. Um, so recruiting the right people with the right skills has come up as a top reason. And then the third and fourth reasons at the bottom there at 16% are the low morale and motivation in the workforce and lack of required resources for employees, which I typically see go kind of hand in hand, mm -hmm. morale and, and resources. It's normally quite a typical reason that morale will be low. Um, but, you know, what would you think in terms of if you were an HR practitioner, um, what would you rec be recommending to people to improve that view on productivity and performance in their organisations? What could they be doing? Oh, if I could answer that question easily, I'd be a <laughs> millionaire. Yeah. I think um, it's a really interesting one. So I, I'm not, I wasn't surprised to see the collaboration piece come out highest. I think we're seeing lots of organisations move back towards having people spend more time face to face you know we're seeing more organizations talk about bringing people back into the office yeah um i actually think there's lots of data out there that shows that not just from a um not from a necessarily from a productivity perspective but from an employee well-being perspective mm -hmm. there's a lot of research out there that shows that actually having a few days a week leads to higher levels yeah. of well-being yeah and we're seeing kind of um symptoms of depression and loneliness at its highest for younger demographics so i think and the reason i'm mentioning that specifically is because there's the how we get people to be really comfortable with that slight shift from how it was a few years ago and what does that collaboration and really excellent way of working look like depending on hybrid or having some teams fully face to face and how you all of those other different things that we're doing as an organization, how you get it right based on all the different ways of working you've got across the workforce. Yeah. So I can see that being a big challenge. We often see um, where there's a lot of um, well-being pressure inside organizations that the first thing that people will jump to is to say that, well, it's either the flexible working piece or it is around the resource and the workload. Yeah. And we know that for lots of organizations that are operating on quite tight kind of cost management kind of um, approaches at the moment um, are putting this kind of squeeze on middle managers to maintain operational excellence, but also be expected to be the inclusive leader that manages and does all of these things to empower and support and coach a multi-generational workforce like you've pointed out mm. so for me personally what i'm seeing and where i think the biggest need and opportunity lies is how we understand how our managers are role modeling managers and leaders are role modeling on a day-to-day -day basis understanding understanding what behaviors actually drive the best performance within their team yes and then focusing for that consistency mm. i personally can't see another way of trying to solve the problem without doing some work with that key area because we're yeah. seeing as you said their well-being lower than it's than you know ever been and they're really facing that challenge at the moment yeah i can't tell you how many clients or or hr people i find know that performance isn't quite there but we can't get to an individual level mm. as to how we're measuring performance and, and that's something that i think again is is 
that could be improved and strengthened like there's lots of other ways of doing it but it's just being mindful that if there are gaps that exist in in how you collect data how you measure performance how you measure people against each other and calibrate then that might be also need addressing in the future as well yeah absolutely if i have one recommendation around if you're thinking about doing anything fresh with insights or, or something like that is try and define what you mean by high productivity and performance so whether that's by team or by department by store if you're a retailer um and actually do some more behavioral exploration and research and actually find out what what, what behaviors people are seeing on a day-to-day -day basis and ask people what they believe their manager does a great job at and what they believe they would love to see their manager do more of so strip all the emotion out of rain yeah um, your manager my lovely manager. manager exactly yeah, yeah. and then what you can do with your insight is you can have a look and say well isn't it really interesting that the higher performing or the most productive parts of our organization yeah. are one where people talk about the culture in this way and see these behaviors far more frequently than than what the the, the lower performing um, parts of the organization are and then straight away you have a really tangible behavior or roadmap of actually if we just get these behaviors role model consistently we're going to solve this productivity and performance challenge. It won't be easy because managers still have that pressure on them, but at least you're giving them something far clearer yeah. that you can focus their own development and support around. The great it's clarity of the winning formula. What yeah, does it look exactly. like? Yeah, how do exactly. I know where I need to exactly. head? Exactly. Tell me exactly what I need to do and support me to do it, basically. Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. All right, then. And then moving through to EDIB, so to diversity, inclusion, and belonging. Um, we asked the question about in the past year, has your workforce become more diverse and inclusive or less? Um, what we are seeing in general is is again is more of a um a varied picture. A lot of them staying the same, a minority becoming less diverse, um, but the majority absolutely say that we are diverse and inclusive. It is interesting because one thing doesn't necessarily mean the other as well. So again, in just thinking about the question and, and then following up, what's interesting is, is when it comes to the challenges that people are seeing, representation is the first thing that they're, they're citing is, is the biggest challenge. And what I'd say with representation is, is that very much has to do with diversity first at mm. that top level and, and building that out. The second part is attraction. So we're talking about attracting diverse people, um, which does go hand in hand with seeing someone that looks like me, then I feel attracted to the organization. I can see a pathway for people like me. And the third one says around creating an environment where employees feel seen and heard. Um, what's really important here is, is to think about it quite you know, broadly. These, these are certain items that people are, are feeling as their key challenge but it may comprise of several things that contribute to that especially in terms of an environment where people feel seen and heard that could be very very complicated um, and quite complex to get under there um you know i i think that starting with edib can be really daunting it's a subject matter that sometimes it's really hard to lean into and have those difficult conversations where do you think people should be focusing their efforts um on making something actually feel quite tangible as a step forward to take. So I, I think one of the things that has um, been a real, uh, I hate to use the word trend when we're talking about ed and I, but it has been in terms of the uh, diverse hiring. And we're now, you know, we're reporting on statistics and data, you know, beyond gender pay gap reporting, but, you yeah. know, um, representation. And, you know, that's becoming a big part of lots of different um, organizational reporting that we're needing to do. So naturally, you start looking at well where do we hire from how do we hire how do we bring more diverse talent into the organization but you know the focus has got to be on what culture they're coming into and how you really strengthen that culture um but we have to go beyond talking about it and we have to go beyond initiatives yeah. to actually making it really deeply embedded in that into how we do everything yeah and and, and that is difficult and it does take yeah. time but you know i think, I think that's okay it takes time what? it cannot change but immediately. It can't, no. No. and there's so there's, it almost felt like with the the edib stuff that there was impatience yeah. to kind of really quickly Get demonstrate that we you know yeah. we really care about this and in the senior positions the representation on your on your c-suite or in your senior roles is a really good good example to use because the reality is that no organization will 
nor really should just suddenly you know remove a load of senior no. leaders no. and that, and i and i don't think that's what colleagues in the organizations are really looking for what they want to see is a genuine sincerity and authenticity and a commitment to creating more opportunities mm -hmm. yeah. for underrepresented groups in the future it's the talent they pipeline. want to see things changing they want the, the talent pipeline and actually how all colleagues no matter where they're from um uh, and no matter of their background have the same opportunities and the same kind of experience the same quality of experience um inside the organization um and so that's that's really for me is the is the, the only real place you can start and so make sure you're really using your feedback to get an idea of um of how people are feeling yeah. and you know if people don't want to self-id their demographics that in itself is a sign that they maybe don't feel so well, absolutely. They do so. Absolutely. if they don't want to take part in the survey for example that's not you know and again another another indication so yeah. use the data that you can get to inform where you're at when it comes uh, when it comes to this Agreed. really important topic. But, yeah, um, I've, I've never seen a prefer not to say response that's um, a, more positive than those that have identified who they are in, in an organisation when they're we're asking yeah. those diversity captures. It may not have been an option on this, but I do wonder one of the biggest challenges, or there is a big challenge generally in with this space um, as to the, the 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 kind of the backlash that I've been getting. Mm. You know there have been lots of um there have been some lots of, revoking haven't there yeah been absolutely lots of colleagues yeah. questioning yeah. what this is about is it really making a difference why are we doing yeah. this um so i actually think a big challenge that we've got uh, at the moment as well is making you know making sure this we don't take any focus away from this and then you really uh, really pushing it and doing more around it and i think you're, you're absolutely right there that geopolitical kind of framework that we're, we're operating in is pushing us to, to have to sometimes go back and back pedal as, as organizations corporations you'll see some of that in the press um, and it's just being mindful of where we want to stand and um you know to quote hamilton but stand for something yeah, um absolutely, absolutely. Right then, in terms of that EDIB question, what's always great is we all know that the multi-generational workplace is, is here. Um, it's only going to become even more multi-generational. Um, but what's really interesting is the reasons and, and the challenges we see uh, in terms of what we think will come across with having all these generations in one place are all quite equal in this list. Um, the top ones around communications, managing expectations, the values alignment are, are really clear here and, and absolutely understandable. I think um, what's really wise is, is to do things where you buddy people up and, and be mindful that each generation has their own viewpoints. Um, but Ryan, your work, where have you seen gaps? Ooh, uh, definitely around the career that we picked, we touched on career. briefly before. Yeah. So um, definitely seeing seeing something there, and as I mentioned, I, I see a lot of it as being, um, you know, still trying to find what it is that excites most um, in a role um, or in the type of organisation, wanting to try new things, but also wanting to have a bit more clarity on what the next steps look like. I really don't. Um, I into lots of these things you hear about the 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 next generation coming in the workforce doesn't have the same ambition as some okay, of the other yeah. generation. Yeah. I think personally think that's something each generation says as they yeah, get yeah. about the yeah. others coming in. And time and time again the data rebukes it. Yes. Um, yeah. And and actually we've got a very ambitious generation um, in the workforce. Yeah. Um, and it'll be really interesting to see if Gen Alpha uh, yeah. are, are the same when they when they come in. Um I think one of one of the challenges is going to be around social connectedness and belonging. So I touched on that bit before around loneliness and depression in in younger yeah. um, things. So that's general kind of global um, um, trending research that, we, that 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 we see. And I, you know, again as a, as a parent of two um, tweens, <laughs> um, it's something that I worry about in terms of you know how much time we spend um, communicating with one another digitally um and using kind of avatars to represent ourselves rather than necessarily having good good, good quality face-to-face -face conversation so i think how we um keep the human in communications and remember and even tap into some of the like neuropsychological stuff of like what actually makes human beings feel good and feel happy i think we need to go back to some of that and actually ask ourselves like, are we doing the right things in the workplace yeah and for this 
And then I think the other bit, I've gone very philosophical, no, haven't I, towards it, towards the end of this. Yeah. But the, the big thing I, I think is that do we really, are we really open to the challenge and the fresh perspective and the drive for change from the younger generation coming into the workforce? Because I've certainly grown up hearing lots of practitioners, um, and I mean, grew up kind of career wise over the last 15 years, hearing lots of practitioners say, well, you know, it's going to take the next generations to come in and really change organizational culture and challenge mindset yeah. that's so deeply ingrained. But now that we're starting to see more generational differences come through, now that we're more generations in the workplace, often you'll hear people saying, oh, you know, the new generation, this it's like entitlement there around, you know, f- flexible working and being able to just choose when they work and how they work and wanting career development opportunities straight away. So I would say for for me, we've got a, a big question to ask ourselves as to how much do we really want to lean in Agreed. to the generational differences yeah. and really properly understand it and really understand how as organizations we can get the most from it mm-hmm. to help, you know, it, influence and improve change for the uh, culture for the better. Um, but yeah, that, I think that was a good reflection point for all practitioners of like, how are you having conversations around generational differences inside your workplace? Agreed. And are you catching some the stereotypes and some of the more negative kind of perceptions as they're reverberating around different parts of the, of the business yeah agreed and especially at that leadership table that's the yeah. key part yeah. place to be challenging that right okay and then we're just moving in i think you kind of teed this up quite nicely actually around trust and, and thinking about digital person and the differences between generations um but we did ask the question about how people feel about the increase in use of ai to support future hr needs um and on the most part it seems that it's met with quite a bit of intrigue um but there's this need to be careful in its application which i think uh, you know hr professionals i would expect to answer more like this that, that we want to adopt we want to move things forward but also we're cautious with things because we are conscious about the human impact and the people impact um, but it's absolutely that that shiny new toy that everybody wants to be deploying and, and being mindful of. Um, but there is still a lack of trust that exists around AI and, and technology in, in general. So it's balancing, I think, the fear of, with adoption for the better and, and seeing how it can be utilised. Have you seen it utilised in, in a, a good way where people have kind of moved forward with something and, and felt very comfortable moving hand in hand with technology or any any? Is it stories that you want to share? Yeah, I think I think there's two two ways to jump to mind. I think AI can do a really good job of um, summarizing large data set for you. Yeah. But then you can bring it to life a little bit more in terms of um, the contextualizing a little bit or communicating it uh, rather than you know doing absolutely everything. So I think in terms of um, being able to understand huge amounts of data, for example, if you've got 50,000 uh, employee comments on a survey, yes. you know, reading every single one of them becomes really difficult. But AI is getting much better at helping us really understand that and then connect it with other interesting data points. So where you've seen some really interesting trends around a particular theme, interesting drops that seem to be impacting another key metric. How can you quickly use AI to kind of give you a sense of what people are actually saying? around those particular themes. So I think it would be really powerful in that way. Mm-hmm. It can therefore give you speed of response because you are able to, to kind of get some knowledge and what it is you need to know more quickly. Um, and then the other side, just just things like, you know, generating um, job descriptions for, yeah. for roles that, the, that you then tailor and make feel right for your particular role. Um, Actually asking um, AI to check whether some communications that you're going to send out is um, inclusive in its language. That would be one of my number one recommendations. And um, I mean, you know, for example, are you about to send a long email to someone who's uh, dyslexic that's really going to struggle to read large block paragraphs of text? So I think there are some really simple ways in which you can use AI to really boost and improve your comms. Yeah um uh some some recruitment practices as well particularly around the the inclusive hiring um and then just still in large data sets but with all three of those things the one common denominator for me would be don't just use AI. also yes. make sure there's some human yeah yeah at least 20 percent maybe yeah we're yeah. gonna put a number on it it's not replacing no less than 20 yeah. percent human yeah. on, on on some of those bits and it will take a while for people to build 
um, trust in it. There was that story, wasn't there, of the of the company that um, hired its first full time AI employee and communicated it out in a particularly mm. challenging way, and it it, it went down like a lead balloon. It went down like a lead balloon because What's clients that? they want to engage with AI, they want to engage with people, which I think is you know we're still very much human and human bits humans make business. Yeah, absolutely. Right, right. So chat and yeah, thank you, Lois. Lovely. I'm great. I'm glad, glad that you're getting um, some things out of our ideas and, and thoughts and conversation. And and again, if anybody's got any questions, please do pop them up here. Um, we will answer any questions that come through. But I am conscious that we are coming to a close of the webinar. So if anybody's got any questions, then please do pop in. It can be about this slide. It can be about anything you like that we presented or just general questions whilst you have a people scientist in the room. Um, they are a juicy bunch, and as you can see, you tell. Ryan's yeah, Ryan's got depth of experience across many industries. That always helps. But if no, no questions, then we what we will do is, is move on to our final slide. Um, so might be a, a thought here, but thank you for joining us at this webinar um, and hearing the updates and highlights from State of Employee Engagement and our thoughts. Um, if you've got any questions, as I said, hello at workbuzz.com. We'd be more than happy to talk to you about anything that we've discussed here, any further questions that you have, or if you want to see anything about Workbuzz and, and our platform, that can absolutely be done too. Um, there are two events that we are sharing here on the left-hand side. You've got Workbuzz Live, which is an in-person event in London on the 5th of November. And we have the wonderful Rebecca Robbins, who's going to talk us, to us um, as our keynote about multi-generational workforces. So if you think that Ryan and I were insightful, I'm sure that we weren't half as insightful as Rebecca Robbins is about to be. Um, and she's got her, her new book with Patrick Dunn as well, that you will receive a free copy if you come to Work Buzz Live. I, I will be great to see you there. Um, and then on the right hand side, we are running another webinar about if we're measuring the right things with our employee surveys and just challenging some thought. I believe you're running that one, right? That will be me again. Yes. yes. So this is an online version of some in-person events we did previously where I can assure our audience that everyone was in the room on those face-to-face um, uh, -face events left wanting to change the way they were mm -hmm. running their employee surveys. What we're going to look at are some real simple um but very impactful um tweaks and changes that you can make to your employee listening approach to get some more of that behavioral insight that i alluded to yeah that's just going to help you do a lot more with your data and tell much more uh much stronger stories um into the business as to what you can really do to drive culture change productivity performance improvements or growth improvements as we talked about Lovely. Finch, in that term. Lovely. please do come along to that that's going to be a good session yeah that okay. sounds great thank you Ryan. So, yeah <laughs> of course he will of course he will but that's uh, less than a week away so obviously if you want to fast follow up at that that would be a great webinar to listen to and, and hopefully make you think a bit differently about what you're asking but I don't believe we have any questions at this point. So what we will do is conclude there and, and say a huge thank you to all of you for joining us on this webinar today um, and have a great rest of your day ahead. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Bye.